Chapter 12 The Secret is Revealed Did you get the milk all right Friday? asked Callie when she brought the milk the next day. You weren't up and I wondered if that dog of Mr. Spencer's could possibly come around to knock it over. Marjorie looked at Penny with big eyes, but Penny merely said, It was all right, Callie. Then by no chance had anyone they could possibly dream of entered and put away that milk. Marjorie, though she loved to see Dottie and usually had plenty to say, could scarcely wait this time till the Clinton girls had gone before exclaiming and wondering to Penny. Penny was quiet. We've got to think this out, Marjorie. Flesh and blood put away that milk and helped himself or herself to some of it. Don't worry about it. We'll talk it all over with the boys when we've had the great surprise. It's ever so funny. Queer, I mean. The ghost of the green lady likes milk, it seems. The conversation ended in a laugh, and the boys, who had disappeared for a time, came in to hurry up breakfast. Breakfast was hurried up accordingly, and now the boys gave orders. The girls were not to look out of windows or snoop around outside, for the surprise would not be complete if they had a glimpse of what Pat was bringing before the boys led them to it. Now promise, said Jimmy, shaking a finger at Marjorie. The girls promised and laughingly started to wash the dishes while the boys shot out of the kitchen door again. Inasmuch as car and boat and the scenes of their various activities were at the rear of the lodge, Penny said that the Allens used their kitchen door almost exclusively. In due time, the boys returned, grinning, talking in excited undertones as they came up on the back porch. Jimmy ran upstairs and came down with two large bandanas. With these, they bandaged the eyes of the laughing girls. Promise not to peek, said Jimmy as he patted the folds over Marjorie's eyes, and Marjorie promised. Penny was thinking that it was a lot of fuss for nothing, but she submitted with smiles, saying that she wouldn't peek if they would promise not to let her stumble and fall. The boys kept up a merry flow of chatter as they led their sisters a roundabout way through the woods, turning them this way and that, with gentle guidance among the trees, till Marjorie finally broke out with the statement that she had been trying to keep the direction to see where they really were going, but she gave it up. It had not been far into the woods, but the boys had avoided the concrete walks and finally led them, not far from their own back door, to a spot where the trees along the shore ended. Now then, cried Jimmy, as he untied the knot at the back of Marjorie's head. Not a word was said for a moment, as the girls rubbed their eyes to accustom them to the light, and then caught their breath at what they saw. There stood Pat with a grin on his face, but they had no eyes for him. At the dock, which they had first said was intended for the yacht of their summer boarders, there floated a large launch or yacht, in comparison to which their treasured little motor boat was at nothing. Oh, Phil, exclaimed Penny, you, you haven't been buying this, have you? With our little bit? Of course not. No, Penny, it's a bit of a problem as it is, like our other belongings. Uncle had planned this for you, Pat says. We were to come up and sail all over the lakes that summer. Pat thinks, because he was giving me the lodge, Uncle wanted to give you something special, too. I don't think you have seen the name on her yet. Looks pretty nice, doesn't it? The Penny Allen. Jimmy and Marjorie had not waited for any comments. They were running along ahead of Penny and Philip, and their excited comments could be easily heard. Pat was there, at the end of the short distance they had to travel, to ask Marjorie if she liked the surprise. Is it a yacht, Pat? she asked. Much as any of them, he answered. Not as large as some and larger than others, and altogether what you should have. It's not a sailing yacht, all decked with sheets from the yardarm, but much better than that, with cabins to sleep in 
and to keep you from the weather night and day. The three were waiting when Phil and Penny came on board, Penny saying that she was sure she was dreaming. How did it happen, Pat? Is it for me, Uncle's gift? Yes, he had a great time picking it out. Perhaps you found a lot of those catalogs and circulars he sent for. You see, the ship had barely come when everything happened. There was no good place to keep her here. So when Mr. Allen's plans were all upset for the summer, he told me to see that she was put away for the winter. Now then, come on over it and we'll talk about what we are to do about it, whether to sell it for a white elephant or to go sailing the seas this winter. Penny was almost amused at Pat's including himself in the decision. She well knew that he was the only one who knew about boats and their upkeep, what it would cost to put her away for the winter, and what they might reasonably expect to get from her sail. Penny was considerably dazed and not a little touched at her uncle's thought of them. She supposed that Pat was jesting about sailing the seas, but oh, how she wished she might keep this beautiful boat. The boat was a 38-foot family cruiser, Pat told the girls, as he had told the boys the day before. It had been carefully selected with a view of being large enough and strong enough to stand heavy seas, and yet not so large that it would require much of a crew or be too expensive to run. In the forward cabin, there were four berths, the same number in the after cabin. Pat said his sleeping quarters could be seen in the after cockpit, whatever that might be, thought Marjorie, who was rather confused at first. The kitchen she must now call the galley, and oh, the nice lockers for your clothes and splendid equipment throughout. Penny, whispered Marjorie, as she and Penny tarried in the forward cabins, which were theirs. Couldn't we have one little cruise in it first, before you sell it for a white elephant? Of course we'll have some trip or other in it, and right away, if the weather permits. Penny had no sooner spoken than she felt the thrill along the keel that meant the boat was in motion. She had not noticed Pat had started the engine. They were moving out. It seems we're going now. They're going to give me one ride at least. They were gone all day. Without their having noticed, the boys had locked up the house and taken their coats to the boat. Pat had a small supply of food in the galley locker with water. Penny said that she felt elegant and quite like the idle rich as she sat on deck, not even having to cook. Marjorie watched the water and the shore and went about exploring. But the first survey satisfied Penny. She sat thinking. What shall I do with this, Phil? She asked after being quiet a long while. Pat, who has known all about it for a long time, says that it will not cost any more to live in this than in a house. I think, privately speaking, that Pat wants to go somewhere in it. Both of them laughed at this, but they sympathized with Pat. They, too, wanted to sail the seas. We can't afford to keep it in order and put it in a yacht basin, or even keep it in repair without being used. We might keep it about next summer for our guests and charge them enough to pay for its maintenance. It is the same old problem, Penny. Everything we need and nothing to keep it going, or next to nothing. Pat has something in his head that he said he would talk about to you one of these times. What are we going to do right now? Keep it at our own dock for the present. Pat says he'll sleep in it. He's afraid it might be carried off. He'll anchor it offshore, maybe, or right inside the breakwater. I don't know. Anyhow, we can trust Pat to do the safe thing. End of chapter 12